hi guys welcome back welcome back welcome back we are back again to write on a video that i would like you to listen because um the lies that have been told about Igbo people and their friends we have to be taking it we have to be taking it one one step one step by step okay we have to be taking it step by step because we don't need to ignore some of the things i want you to understand that when you hear them talking about Igbo q 1967Q and all that, people believe, people actually believe that the soldiers that were that were involved in the queue, in the queue plot and everything they said that happened in those days, you know, that the way they killed the leaders and all that, nobody is support of uh, evil or killing anybody. But the lies is that Igbos are the one organized that and supervised the, the queue. But Let's hear from these people because there's something I want us to understand from that. So at the meeting of the leaders of thought, they wanted Aula was forgiveness. By this time, Ojuku in the eastern region had refused to recognize the authority of Guon. Ojuku seized federal assets in the east and confiscated federal revenue. He detained a civilian Nigerian airway flight that landed in Enugu. He refused to attend meetings of the Supreme Military Council. It was clear Nigeria was headed for a civil war. Did Awolowo react appropriately to Juku's actions? I think what he did... I think the, um, I'll put it in two ways. There were his thoughts and there were his actions. And I think the first was, of course, the West was in a very weak position. All the troops in the West were largely from the North. Because historically, the Westerners had always looked down on military. If I always thought it's only uneducated, lazy people that will join the army. So really, really, when you get to the army, then outside the medical corps and the education corps, you really find the Southwesterner. So all the barracks and military cantonment in the Southwest were peopled and officered by Northerners. Before the January, the July event, perhaps there were some Easterners there that were in Abelkuta. Some of them in Ibadan. But when the re return march happened, for their own safety, they ran. So the leadership of the army, Nigeria, I mean, in, in the West, were in the arms of the Northerners. We had all so the Igbos in Abelkuta, did they run away or some of them were also massacred? Absolutely massacred, and the remaining had to run. They didn't run away, they ran in the interest of their life. Why were they taken on unawares? I keep thinking. They've dubbed the first coup an Igbo coup. And the you. The first one was never an Igbo coup. So, like I told us in previous video that we met, you know, when we discussed about the same issue of uh, these lies of Igbo coup and all that nonsense. That was, that was not like Igbo Q. It's just that it's just, it's, it, they just use that to create problem, to create hate on Igbo tribe. And people carry that all this while. Believing that it was a plan, it was, that the 97 Q was a plan of Igbo people to exterminate other, other tribe. There was nothing like that. The Q plotters are people from different ethnic groups. Yes, you may say that Igbos are well, maybe Igbos were more in number, but you cannot use that to target Igbo Q. The man that you are, that, that, that you are listening to now, this elderly man, is just an Igbo man. But he's setting the record straight, even though the interviewer happened to, I believe he's an Igbo person. You know, but he wants to work like a journalist, he don't want to sad anybody, which is okay. I understand that, but the record need to be, you know, set straight. Igbos were never targeted anybody. This is just, just like a group of soldiers, you know, looking for a better governance and uh, making sure they sanitize the system. 
what they perceive to be corrupt or corrupt leaders, they want to make sure they get rid of them. And they believe that this is the best way to go about it. Whether their decision and what they did is right or not, I'm not here to justify. But what we have to talk about is the intention and the motive of the people that carried out the queue. They did not, it's not about Igbos looking for who to buy and all that. And we are going to listen more of this because the man says something very, very interesting on this video. But let it be on record that it was, it was never an Igbo queue. And the only thing that made them to go by that is just for, for they want they want to make sure that they get rid of corrupt corrupt uh, leaders you know what they what they what they call corruption then happen to be you know uh something like normal thing now if people if you compare the lifestyle of nigerian nigerian government and politicians then to what we have now then you can you may you may tend to say that those people were innocent to compare the position that they, that, we, that we have in Nigeria today. Now, let's continue. It was not an Igbo coup, it was a Nigerian coup. Can you explain? It's a Igbo Yoruba man, they are Igbo. The author of this book? Yes. Very, very intellectual. It was not an Igbo coup? It wasn't an Igbo coup. It was a coup of genuine Nigerians who were worried about Nigeria. Yes, they were young, generational. It was the generation that brought them together. It was their willingness to risk their lives to have a better Nigeria that brought them together. It wasn't to put an Igbo man or create an Igbo empire. No. Um, this Igbo himself is Midwest Igbo. In normal parlance, it is not an original Igbo. So, he wasn't doing all of that. If Ajuna was Igbo. Yeah, he was Igbo. On what to Igbo, Igbo. Yes. They were, most of the officers were Igbo officers. The, what joined them together was intellect. Intellectual revolt. What about that Nigeria? Most of them were educated. They were university graduates. Most of the army officers, senior army officers killed, were from the north. The it's premier of the western region was killed. The premier of the northern region was killed. Michael Okwara was not killed. That was a failure of individual operators. Tell me more. From in planning the coup, um, they broke Nigeria into territories, and each person had rules he had to play. Nzegu was in charge of the north. When he moved, he sought even the support of Ujuku who never gave him support. But Ujuku knew about the coup? He, not before. He was not party to the planning of the coup. From everything I've read. But of course for you to Take over government. Don't forget Zegu was just a trainee officer. And he was using trainees. And Ojuku was the commander in Kano. So he needed him. He reached out to him and he didn't give him support. So if it was an original Ibuku, of course, Ojuku would give him support and he would have taken over. Because they have the largest um, collection of military in the north. But he did it. Uh, in the in the west, of course, it's, it's succeeded because the environment was against Akintola himself. So it was easy. And of course, because he reacted in a different way, he decided to fight. He decided to shoot. No other person did that. It was the only one. And of course, the... the when you the, say he decided to shoot, how? When they, they captured his deputy. The, the military boys can be very... <laughs> can be something else. They captured his deputy. So it was the deputy that led them to his house. It was he who spoke to him. He didn't know the military was. There would be a military movement. 
When he now discovered that Fadeka Ade had military boys waiting, he also had prepared for such days, not of military but of civilian. He thought the operation where the people would probably come to his house one day. So he took his uh, submachine gun and opened fire. You know, mind you, he had been warned of a coup. Yes, which, is, which was why a day before the coup, he flew to the north to discuss it with Sardana. And Sardana said it was impossible. That it was impossible? Because he was sure of the northern command. And he was sure of the loyalty of uh, Agui Rosi. And Agui Rosi had no reason to, not to be loyal to them. It was not to be the GOC. It was not recommended by the military. The outgoing General Everard or what? Never recommended him. Did he recommend Baba Femi Ogundikwe? He didn't either. I think he recommended Malamari. Mm. But Balewa and Sadana opted for Erosi. He said, let's keep seniority. So why would Erosi want to fight them? No reason. Absolutely none. So he had no reason to join to be part of conspiracy. Did he see they didn't see Nzogu coming? Nobody. And that's what happens to politicians. But there was movement of troops in Kaduna. It was clear. It was just for training. And he does that regularly. Even from evidences, <laughs> those troops didn't know what they were doing until they got to points of action. They thought they would carry them, they would train them, but it was a revolutionary. So you may not agree with him, you may not agree. I know some of you that are from Oduduwa land or from Northerners, you may not agree with him. You may say, oh, he's not, uh, why is it that Igbo, Igbos were not killed and all that? But one thing you need to understand is that when, like the man said here, that that is revolutionary. They are trying to make sure they, try, they carry out this to achieve something. But the question is who and who were in power when, those, when the action was carried out. You, you cannot deviate from the fact that Northerners dominate many, many key positions and you don't, you don't need to start you know, complaining about oh, you, where is Igbo people, why is it that people were not killed. After all those things, as they, they decided to take the law into their hands, they decided to revenge, they carried the revenge action out, and they fired many Igbos, right? After fired many Igbos, they are still not satisfied because not one, not two, not three, immediately after that queue, on the, this day, a year cannot pass without massacring of people that has to do with Igbos in Nigeria. Until this day, not only that, the hatred started and everything. So we can go on and on. But the fact is that if you know where, where your problem is coming from, then you, then only you can know how to avert it. Do you understand? Because people that would that drive joy in line and propagating fake fake news and making sure that they they bring, drag you down, make sure that you be because they want you to be the way they want you to. They want to see you. They don't want anything progress anything uh, success in you and that's the problem now listen to him because I will, I will play the video to the end let's continue and they are always in the midst of decadence some revolutionary in the midst of darkness there will be one source of light wasn't he too brutal wasn't he too brutal the way Ahmad Bello was murdered was Nzogu not too brutal? When you look at it today, you would think so. But at that time, a failure at that point was the end. And you know, he's a military man, a young man, well trained. He went to Sandhurst. Sandhurst was the best training center in the British Commonwealth. <laughs> he knew that if he failed, his death. So it's either you die or you kill. And he knew if he was unable 
to penetrate the Sadana hegemony. That was the end of the coup. And he believed that the feudalism they were talking about, you know, any, any, any Marxist, there are many in the South there, any radical, you criticize the feudalism in the North. And he was seen as the epitome. Was the Sadowna next in rank to the Sultan? So he wasn't just a premier, he also had religious control. So for him not to pay, you, 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 you don't operate like, um, how would I call it, a shooter. You do what you call a spray uh, shooting. Ha, I must kill this one. Because if I don't, that will be the end of the exercise. And he was the leader. So he, he assigned to himself the most difficult assignment. So if he failed, everything. The guys in but the East. But looking backwards now, it will look brutal. Mm. Because he took Amadou Bello's wife along. They took uh, Sode and his wife along too. The guys in the East did not execute theirs. Now, let us look at this, the truth of the circumstances. They just had a federal, uh, sorry, a Commonwealth meeting in Lagos. And all of them have been going away. And most of them were aware there would be a coup because they had better intelligence through their embassies. But we see how Archbishop Macario Saran, who was visiting the East, as at the day of the action. You have to look at the international dimension to it. You attack Opara with Macarius. So, that was a possibility. I'm, I'm doing my own analysis now. Yes. And in this matter, we have to be objective analysts. Will he kill Abisho Macarius alone? So, he had to stay home for Macarius to leave, but coup had already started. And because it was uh, Ife Ajuna that had responsibility for that, a lot of people now interpret it. And they may be right, but from the way I look at the international dimension to it, it may just be, let's wait until Macarius will leave. Action had happened in the north, it had happened in the west. There was no need for the Midwest because there was a new state, a new region, and there was no, uh, there was no environmental hostility to the incumbent government the way it was. And Dennis Osadebe, who was there, uh, in the political calculation, was not a significant element. So it is possible that sheer incompetence of people like Junior or ethnic sentiment or international political sentiment, out of those three, could have interfered with him. But was there any reason to take out Okwala? The environment was friendly to Okwala at the time. Actually, it, I don't believe it could have been part of the original plan. I was a part of it. I'll be able to read it. If this coup plan has thought that the man to lead the year was Aulawo. I don't know if you listen to what he just said, that those coup planners thought that Aulawo would be the person to lead. They felt that Aulawo is the best man to lead Nigeria. That was what, what uh, is it, I think, Mbazumika, I believe, that elderly man that uh, died two years ago that made a video to explain what happened he's one of the soldiers that are involved in the in the coup he said that the idea of that coup was to make sure that they free a world war from Calabar prison so that all will become president or prime minister or whatever they're running that time of nigeria the same people that fought for a world war to lead nigeria okay let Afghan face criticism from people from Awolowo's tribe. 
Yoruba man and average Yoruba people will not especially if they are from their class. They will not they, most of them will come out and start telling, yo, you Iboku, Iboku. They are the one pushing that nonsense, trying to create problem. And if it, my my own question to them is that after saying all those things, you know you felt that that is an Iboku, yet you are here after revenging killing a lot of Igbos in the north and in the west. So even if it was Igbo Q or no, whatever, you haven't your revenge enough, what is going on? Why the hate of it today? Let's continue. And his political partner is Okmara. Why would they want to kill him? Let's look at it objectively. Part of the causes of the coup was the 1964 federal election. Action Group, SNC, formed OPGA. In the absence of Paolo, they, they had a joint leadership, as it were. Opara and the wife of Paolo. And they campaigned together all over Nigeria. So when you look at it analytically, it will be strange if people thought that this rubbish, and they thought this rubbish was based on feudalism, there's no feudalism in this. They thought there were partners and collaborators with feudalists in the West. They eliminated them. They thought there were also collaborators in Lagos. That had to do with Okutiebo, Balewa. They eliminated them. So what would be the reason? for dealing with the co-leader of what they saw as the only hope for Nigeria. Azikiwe left the country before the if coup. I, if Azikiwe had been the country, they would eliminate him. You think so? I believe so. Why did he leave? Did he have premonition of the coup? He probably did. And because that is him. I believe that as if we always do for safe ground. He did that 1951-52. You had to have a lecture, a very radical lecture against the British government. You know how to plan the lecture. It was still an NCNC there. It was not a national group. Every young man loved Azikwe. They loved his intellect. They loved his grandiloquence. And they followed him. But came lecture time. As if he had disappeared. As usual. Why? I think there's some cowardice in him. Some cowardice? I think so. So the point you make is that it wasn't an Igbo coup. I'm clear my man in that. We are discussing history. And another book I'm recommending to you. To have a better understanding of the discourse and form your own opinion. Is this book Ironse? Nigeria, the Army, Power and Politics, written by Chooks Ilwebunam. This book is a classical work on the story we are discussing. I did not bring the book Nzogu, written by our passenger. That is another classic you should read. So you can get this book on udarabooks.com and you can also buy it on WhatsApp. The numbers are pinned to this broadcast. We are looking at history, politics and power. I have recommended Why We Struck by Adewali Ademoyiga. Now I am recommending Ironsi. Nigeria, the army, power, and politics. It's about learning and unlearning. We are talking about Awolowo in the Nigerian Civil War. And when you talk about the war, one name that must come up is Ujuku. So look at this book, Emeka, written by Frederick Forsyth. Emeka is a classical work, if you want to know more, about... Colonel Chukwemeka, 
Odumegu Ojuku. You can get this book on udarabooks.com. I am discussing with Dr. Yemi Farumbi, looking at the background to the war. Okay, my people, you have heard it all, so we don't need to stretch it. I believe you have learned a lot from this, and the truth is out. We need to be discussing it because if you keep quiet, they will tell your own history for you. And when your enemy is telling you, writing your own history, you can imagine how, what the outcome will be. So it's always good for you to tell your, tell your own story when you are here. You know what I mean by when you are here, when you are, why you are still living, because a dead man cannot tell anything, cannot tell anybody what, what he went through, what he spent, how he spent his life. Now that we are here, we need to discuss this thing because people that are bringing this fake information are pushing it from generation to generation. That's why you will hear people telling you that my father told me that an Igbo man is worse people that you can deal with. An Igbo man who came to Ukraine land and and they, and they forced themselves on our women. They killed our children. They do this without knowing that people that actually did that are those that push that that, that are seen as a heavy angels. So we don't need to go into that. But all I can tell you is that a lot of lies about the Igbos in Nigeria, about the Biafrans and everything. So. We need to start learning it one by one and tell our people the truth and what happened. Thank you so much for your time. And before you go, like the video and share it. Subscribe if you are new. See you again on the next one. Bye-bye for now.